Hi, and welcome to the Smart Driving Cars podcast. Glad you're with us. This edition is sponsored by the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. For more information, head to MOTOETF.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with the Faculty Chair of Autonomous Vehicle Engineering at Princeton University, Alan Kornhauser. Hi, Alan. Hey, good evening, Fred. Good evening, everybody. Well, it was a pretty active week for news, even before the infrastructure bill won final passage heading into the weekend. On top this week, a piece from Russ Mitchell in the Los Angeles Times headlined, Tesla's handling of breaking bug in public self-driving test raises alarms. This was in a recall report to safety regulators that prompted uh, Tesla to initially pull its uh, full self-driving update before it put it back out again, I guess. Right. So I think it's, you know, Russ Mitchell and us and so on, uh, or at least a few of us have been sort of questioning um, um, Tesla's approach uh, to full full self-driving. And I think, uh, you know, what we've been trying to, what seems to have been um, the, the situation is that, uh, is that the automated emergency braking system is turned off when autopilot and and full self driving is turned on, or it seems, you know, why else uh, would the Joshua Brown crash happen? Why else would uh, would Teslas run into um, emergency vehicles? It's not. I don't think really about the, you know seeing whether or not there are flashing lights. It's just that. Uh, it's just that stationary objects, I think, are, are disregarded uh, when the uh, automated emergency braking system is off. Now, whether or not their automated emergency braking system um, deals appropriately with stationary objects is a whole other question. I suspect that it does, um, you know, because, of course, uh, the purpose of that is to, um, is to when something weird happens ahead, uh, that's unexpected, uh, of course, by the driver, and then the automated emergency braking system kicks in. And the kicking in is usually associated with stationary objects. Uh, sure, you may be catching up to the vehicle in front of you too quickly and so on, but uh, in a sense, the automated, um, um, the intelligent cruise control systems work pretty darn well. Uh, because uh, one of the things that they focus on are, are moving objects ahead of you. And the key uh, differentiator of a moving object in front of you versus a stationary object in front, in front of you is the closing velocity, uh, your, your speed relative to that vehicle. To stationary objects ahead, your, your, your speed relative... Uh, to a stationary object is essentially, you know, your speed. So in the in the in the algorithm, that comparison says, uh, hey, identifies those things pretty well. It also identifies the vehicles that you're following pretty well because then your closing speed on it, your speed relative to to your nose, is something different than your speed. And that's why you're closing in on it. And, and that's why you know it's a moving vehicle ahead. And of course, uh, one deals very well with moving vehicles ahead. You basically, um, hey, you know that's a vehicle. Um, uh, there's very, there are very few false alarms or false positives of those things. It's well identified. And so you, um, uh, you try to not uh, rear end them. And uh, the systems work uh, really well uh, for that. It's, it's really pretty easy. The problem is with stationary objects ahead. And uh, you just, they're not expected to be there. Or if they are there, you're, the expectation is you, you can pass underneath them or over them. They're tiny. But the expectation is that you can pass underneath them. So if you're traveling in places like the, Pennsylvania Turnpike, for example, in which um, there are overpasses one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. In a sense, each one of those overpasses as you're approaching them is a stationary object. Of course, you know, you disregard it. You say, oh my goodness, I can pass underneath it. 
So of course you disregard it until the stationary object is one that you can't pass underneath. And that's when things get dicey. And it seems as if um, um, they aren't being vigilant enough about stationary objects ahead. At least it's been my contention, um, you know, I'm still waiting for some people to write to me and say that I'm so stupid, you know, of course we do. Um, but um, nobody has yet. Maybe nobody's listening to us, Fred. Uh, well, that's not true either. They're, they are listening to let us know if, if you. If yeah, you I mean, seriously, if we're, if we're wrong, I hope they let NHTSA know. NHTSA should ask them seriously. The question is not about uh, autopilot. It's not about full self-driving. It's about the automated emergency braking system. And to me, the automated emergency braking system is a foundation to these things. You know, it's supposed to take care of, of crazy stuff that's happening out there, stuff that wasn't expected. That's what it's there. That's what an emergency braking system is, is focused on. And certainly when we're driving, I, I would like to have one on my car that, oh, my goodness, uh, saves my life. And if it's uh, the automated emergency braking, uh, the, 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 the autopilot that's driving, then it should save autopilot. And if it's a full self-driving uh, system that's driving, it's a, it should save the full self-driving system. You know, that's, that's a foundation. And it seems as if they turn off the foundation. Well, of course, that's what they did as soon as they were getting, you know, um, um, ran, what people said were random breakings as they were going down the road, what they do, they turned off the automated emergency braking system. Well, that's the first indication that they had it on before, maybe in version 10.2, 10.1, 9. Point whatever, 9. Point whatever, whatever. <laughs> it was never turned on in the first place. They finally turned the, that system on in, in 10.3 and they said, oh my goodness, the false positives of this thing are are unacceptable it's not good enough and so they need to put they need to just get back and put all their intelligence and all their 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 efforts to getting that thing to work and then autopilot full self-driving great well, you also highlight a, a youtube video in the latest uh, newsletter it's titled uh, labeled can tesla full self-driving drive you home from work uh no is, is what the headline here is yeah well that's that's what the but, but i looked at it for different reasons i looked at it for to see what they're drawing on their display and and whenever you're stopped and there there are vehicles traveling in front of you you're trying to make a t or turn at a, at a t intersection guess what it draws a vehicle here draws a vehicle here doesn't draw it when it's straight ahead, draws it again when it's here and when it's here. Hmm. Why didn't it draw it here? Okay, explain, please. It may not have drawn it there because guess what? It's a stationary object with respect to this direction of the velocity vector. Ooh, does that mean it disregarded it? It saw it, but then pass it away. And then when it went to the, the place where it gets drawn, it's not there anymore because it was disregarded. Is that why it's not drawn? Well, the, the full self-driving update overall, and because of this experience perhaps too, uh, seems to be getting some mixed reviews from owners oh, out no, there. I, 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 heard, the, I heard from one I know who worked very hard to get his driving score up to 99 so he could qualify to get the update. And uh, a note back from him says it's pretty incredible early and not perfect, but incredible. So I guess, you know, yeah, it's not perfect. Well, <clears throat> I don't think anybody's perfect except for you, Fred, but, you know, <laughs> um, but, but really nothing's perfect and, and darn it, it looks darn good. Okay. And in, in the one video as you're watching it, it, he claims it breaks. Uh, did it hit the brake or did it just go off the throttle? 
or whatever. I don't know. What do you call a throttle in an electric car? I don't even, <laughs> I don't know what, whatever you call it. But when you go off the throttle, when you go off the, the electric pedal in a Tesla, it kicks in regenerative braking. Okay. So is it just the regenerative braking that, that, that was kicked in at that point or did it actually, you know, hit the calipers and, and close and, 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 and hit the brake? And what was the situation? He's going down a two lane road and there's a vehicle on the other side approaching. Sometimes when I'm on a two lane road and there's another vehicle on the other side approaching, I let off the gas. I don't have an electric car. You know, because, hey, you know, they're, you know, your relative velocity then is twice, you know, if you impact, you know, it's the impact energy is uh, what, four times, this is V squared, whatever, delta V squared, Whew. yipes. Sometimes you, I let you've off got the, the gas white board or the black that. board. I'll let you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you let. A, I think it's uh, it's almost a natural that it does that, and so it got. You know, so, geez, it maybe you know, sort of it's processing. The guy coming across, the guy heading my way, coming across the double line or something like that. Whew, you're sweating bullets. I sweat bullets every time I drive. It's amazing I made it this far in my life. You know that you know between the age of what uh, you know like seven to 60 the highest probability of of death is is death by auto or a death in an auto accident <sighs> or i shouldn't call them accidents or crashes excuse me death in auto crash well that's why you're doing this alan to change those numbers in part yeah well one in part that the other part right. is to provide mobility Absolutely. Now, Cruz made some significant news this past week. Uh, CTO and President Kyle Vogt became the first to ride a completely driverless cruise vehicle in San Francisco. No safety driver involved. And he, put, so, he put the whole experience online. Too, sure. No. And, and congratulations, Kyle, for, for, for doing it. I mean, congratulations on, you know, uh, creating the the company in the first place, selling it to to GM and getting it to this point. Although you know, I would hope that Kyle is uh, is maybe the best safety driver that uh, or safety attendant that Cruz has, and and certainly would know how to I don't know grab the wheel or maybe had a had a keypad or something like that in the vehicle as he was riding i'm not sure but uh, whatever but yeah uh, but yeah i i think it's it's um uh, they're doing it with employees they're doing it at night which were i guess it's it, it really is easier at night because there are fewer things happening in many places in some places at night it's it's not easy, but um, great. It's, it's wonderful to have, a, you know, a, a second entity doing driverless mobility um, on real streets in, in real environments. And they, they held a, a look under the hood session, I guess, uh, a day or so afterwards where they had to, a lot of explanations for some media that they were able to call in. Right. And they, they provided a, a, a good description of what they're doing and everybody should take a look at it. We've linked it. Uh, uh, Brad Templeton wrote a nice article about it. You know, there's there's information in the in the in our e-letter that um, that describes it. And, and yes, it's uh, it's it's nice to for them to have reached uh, this point. It's a major milestone. And we're hoping Cruz will come on with us in the near future to sure to and discuss. Yeah, and then come on with us to discuss that and come to Trenton. We'll be back with more, but first, this is a good time to remind you about our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF. The ticker symbol is MOTO. And to get more info, you can head to MOTOETF.com. On the website, there's a white paper you should read. It's called The Smart Transportation Revolution. It's under the Insights and News tab. Some great information there to help you make informed decisions about investing. ETFs, you probably know, can be a smart way to spread risk with investments and focus on a particular category of stocks. The website, once again, is MOTOETF.com. We're back with more of Smart Driving Cars. 
Alan, we've talked about Tesla and Cruise, but Waymo has grabbed some headlines as well, announcing it's bringing Waymo Driver to the streets of New York City. I don't know. I, it's um, you know. Well, Mo Mobileye I, uh, was doing work there already too. Right? Yeah, Mobileye. I don't know if they they're still there. GM Cruise went there. I think they lasted like twelve seconds and said, "Oh my goodness, this is maybe the last place we would want to do things." And maybe that's why they're the first ones in San Francisco uh, doing driverless. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I, my opinion is that, uh, is that Manhattan is the last place for these things, you know, some 40, 50 years from now when everybody else has them, maybe they'll show up in Manhattan. I mean, they claim they're, they're mapping things. Okay. They're mapping stationary things that are supposedly there all the time. But if you're dry, I don't know. When I drive through New York, I basically see no stationary things. And I only see things that move. And the whole process of, of, of driving in Manhattan is, is trying to get through that thing and, and, and through the maze of other moving objects, people, bicycles, scooters, cars, trucks, you know, who knows what. And everything that's not in the database that they're creating and so I don't know. Yeah, I guess you go in there and create the database, but you know. Um, and on top of that, there's not a there's not uh, necessarily a need for more kinds of mobility there as there are in so many other places. Well, that's that's what I think, and then, you know, and, and and for them to provide a mobility that's competitive with the mobilities that already exist in Manhattan. Um, if they're that good, um, they must be really good, uh, because, because first of all, in, in Manhattan, you know, the, the first thing you do is walk and then you grab one of the city bikes, or then you grab one of the scooters, or then you grab a yellow cab, or if you're on an expense account and your company's paying, you get a black the car and then and then the, the buses have bus lanes and and of course there's a 24 7 subway there and really this subway is very good even though it maybe doesn't have the you know in some sense the best reputation it's it's really very good and they're, they're going to compete so that you know when when a customer is looking at the options you know, to uh, and, and how he or she wants to get from A to B, all of a sudden they'll say, oh, I want to take a Waymo. <laughs> Good luck. If you know your way around the subway, it can get you within a few blocks of almost any place you want to go to. Absolutely, you know, and, and okay, so you're going to move one or two people around in Manhattan? Um, I... I, I, I you know, you would have thought that, that after they realized that they're in, in Chandler, where there's no market for them, where did they go? The place where these, there's even less of a market for them. I mean, come on. We'll be talking more about that in a few minutes, I think. Yes. But, yeah. Here. Well, you know, I, I <laughs> guess they're more interested in that than coming to Trent. And that's fine. You know, there are other players in this world. Well, Aurora made its stock market debut on Thursday, raising $1.8 billion before fees. Another, another fairly exciting development showing what's happening in this whole industry. Right. And, you know, and I guess having a valuation of 10.6, which is not a bad valuation. I mean, I guess, although when you, if, you, if it's valued at 10.6 and you raise 1.8, who got, who, who got the eight in the middle or the nine in the middle? What few? I don't know. I guess that's big fees. I, I don't know. I didn't. That's, that's why I'm not. That's why I'm poor. I guess. Never mind. Uh, but um, yeah, no. It, it's good that they're they're out there. Although you know, if one looks at at how well uh, um, Wall Street has treated um, the, these companies so far, it's um, um, it's it's not Tesla. There are reports that the electric VW microbus, which I think has been called the ID Buzz, is on track to debut in, in Europe next and arrive in the U.S. in 2023. And they're talking about 
level three autonomy is, is part of this. <laughs> Whatever level three. I mean, get out of here. Forget level three autonomy. But but the interesting piece is that maybe Ford or Argo, uh, you know, because of their partnership with VW, would basically have that as as a as a base vehicle for for autonomous taxis. Uh, sounds interesting to me. Um, um, yeah, I mean, be, it's obviously be... a ride sharing kind of vehicle, right? So. Yeah, because because of course it has the capacity and a, and it's it's maybe easier to get in and out than a than a Chrysler Pacifica with the sliding doors and so on and so forth. And um, you know, you put a little psychedelic whatever on on the side of it, it could be the '60s all over again. Absolutely, and now all that stuff is legal in, in a lot of states. So. Yeah, I guess <laughs> you know, I, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, it would. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's kind of neat, whatever. Speaking of, uh, of ride sharing, uh, the Verge reports Uber prices are still way up. So the company is planning to bring back carpooling. Uh, Uber pool was shut down in March of last year uh, during the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, really. Yeah, you know, and it's focused. It's, it seems to be focused on, on corporations and trying to provide uh, capabilities for for corporate carpooling. Corporate carpooling, you know, a lot of effort's been put into that in the past, and it's had marginal success. I mean, you look at the, uh, it's just it's just tough, and and um, and I think you know just doing it for the ride to work on for a few folks, maybe maybe not, um, um, you know, to make a significant difference. I think. Um, I think to to really Im- increase uh, average vehicle occupancy, which is really the key thing, is that um, is that you really need dynamic carpooling. That you have opportunities throughout the day to br- bring people together to ride. I mean, it, it's it's sort of amazing that that for example at Newark Airport. In the um, in the distribution of, of 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 arriving air passengers to wherever they're going out of a Newark airport, that isn't just much better organized through Uber, Lyft. You know, I mean, all those folks getting all the, off of all those United Airlines flights, they they all come in, you know, about the same time. They're Many of them are going to common destinations, and there there seems to be no effort at, at Newark Airport to to share rides. There seems to be no effort at LA, LAX to share rides. Seems like that you know the the folks that are standing in line or coming down the line, um, one should try to encourage them to share rides uh, somehow. They they've come off the same plane, many of them. They do have something in common. They're not total strangers. Well, we have seen and that in some in some cities, some airports. Very little, very very little. There's uh, and uh, you know, and I don't know if people think it's an invasion of privacy. And yes, I guess on my United app, I might have an opportunity to, you know, just you know, click to get a Uber ride or something. But the opportunity to share. Is 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 and, and going to com- you know not necessarily common destinations, but very closely common destinations, with the kind of peak demands that they have, and really the few number of places people actually go from airports. Um, you know, there there just should be more opportunities there, and there, there's the the information systems to um, to first of all figure out who who could. And then how to entice them to do it, uh, maybe just out of their own public spiritedness. Uh, but uh, but then again, um, the drivers I don't think want it uh, because because if you're an Uber or Lyft driver, where's your best ride coming from? It's probably coming from a Newark airport. Why? Because it's probably a business traveler who's probably going to tip you the most. And so you want to spread each of those individuals to as many of your drivers as you can. And certainly you don't want to, you know, the driver doesn't want to have a too disgruntled business um, um, 
uh, riders in the back, uh, and and it's not done. I mean, for years, at least going back probably 50 years, um, <clears throat> the uh, the dispatcher of taxis outside of Union Station in Washington D.C. would would always uh, try to um, to put. Uh, multiple people in the back of taxi cabs out of that. And every time a Metroliner came down and, and disgorged its passengers, all the people would line up in the, in the taxi cab the line and, and, and the dispatcher would ask you where you're going and, and, he'd, and point to a cab to, to get in. And then where are you going? And he'd sort of remember who he put on which cab and then got another rider in there to try to again, um, uh, make it much more efficient the flow of cabs out of Union Station. And did a, it was amazing how good of a job that guy did in his own brain, sort of uh, getting people to just putting them in cabs. You, you really didn't have a choice coming out. I mean, you could if you wanted to be a whatever, uh, but you know, you just hopped in and he was so good that, you know, he, he knew depending on where you said you were going, whether or not the other person that was in the cab was going in that direction and basically just drop that person off on the way to dropping you off. I mean, there's none of that, as my knowledge, there's none of that done at any of these airports. That's, you know, whatever. Uber and Lyft could do it themselves, but why they haven't, I don't know. I've seen passengers coming into something like the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas when there are these throngs of people arrive at once. People in standing in line for cabs will, will say, hey, where are you going? Where are you going? And maybe- I do that. And when I'm standing, that sure. thing is infinitely long. And the, the dispatcher there is putting one person, one cab, one cab, one cab, one cab. And it's because the cab dri- drivers, they don't want more per- people in somebody's cab because then they're not going to get a ride. And it's a, just a... I call it a poop show out there in the, you know, the first couple of days of CES. But anyway, you know. Hey. Moving on. Some other news this week took place here in New Jersey. We had a gubernatorial election, and that does have something to do with the future, <laughs> hopefully, of uh, uh, autonomy in the Garden State. Yeah, we're almost out of business, Fred. I mean, uh, um, I don't know if we can, you know, try to work on a new governor. I mean, that would have been starting all over again, but it, it looks that like we're very pleased that uh, Governor Murphy got reelected. I think that um, the opportunities here in New Jersey as we've been trying to create a welcoming environment for, for what we call um, equitable, affordable, high quality mobility is, um, is um, is in good standing, and um, we'll see what we can make happen in, in New Jersey. I mean, we're hopefully we're going to you know have a a welcome mat out there, and um, we'll see if anybody comes. I mean, they'll probably all go to Manhattan. <laughs> you know, whatever. And uh, of course, that all. Uh is going to be a big part of the next uh, summit, the Princeton Smart Driving Cars Summit, which is now so, scheduled for next spring. Yeah, next spring. So we're we're really looking at um, it now that uh, we basically, uh, with Governor Murphy, we have a, a four-year runway to, to make things happen. Um, um, uh, we're going to, you know, get some things prepared. We're doing, we're doing, um, uh, studies in Trenton uh, as we speak to, to understand uh, the mobility needs of, of, of the residents uh, and because in a sense uh, uh, we want to make sure that uh, that whatever uh, system we in, systems we invite here in New Jersey uh, serve their needs and, and so um, we're doing that community involvement right now and uh, and focusing on mobility we're not focusing on the bling of the technology we're focusing on the on the substance of the of the mobility so stay tuned there is much more to come on that thank you to our sponsor the smart etfs smart transportation and technology etf the ticker symbol for the etf is moto and more information is available at motoetf.com You can find us at smartdrivingcar.com, 
on Anchor FM, Spotify, TuneIn, Apple, Google, Spreaker, Amazon, SoundCloud, and more, wherever you get podcasts. And your smart speaker can play us too. You can find my tech reports at textination.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Alan Kornhauser. Thanks for listening or watching. Have a great rest of the weekend and stay safe. Thank you for listening and watching.